Welcome to The Elephant, made with the support of the Climate Kick Alumni Association. I'm Kevin Kaners. Je regarde euh, la salle, je vois que la réaction est positive, je n'entends pas d'objection. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. Those are the sounds from the moment when the Paris Agreement was struck when delegates representing 195 countries from around the world reached a landmark deal to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there are a few main parts to their agreement, but at its core was the declaration that the nations of the world would collectively take action to keep the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius. The accord was heralded as historic by the media and by politicians, but in some ways, it was incredibly short on specifics about how we're going to get there. So you might wonder, what will it actually take for us to meet these goals? And what does science tell us about by how much and how fast we'll need to cut our emissions in order to make what was declared in Paris a reality? Well, answering that question is exactly the area that Kevin Anderson works in. He's a professor of energy and climate change at the University of Manchester and he's the deputy director of the Influential Tyndall Center. Kevin takes what we know from climate science and applies knowledge from other fields, like engineering and policy. He does this to map out various scenarios or emissions curves that would allow us to stay within our carbon budget and have a high probability of meeting the goals we've set. And I'm afraid he doesn't have good news for us. You see, the thing is, we've waited a really long time. All of your life, People of my generation have chosen to do absolutely nothing about climate change. Worse than doing nothing, we've actually watched the emissions go up. In fact, we've waited so long that despite what we agreed to in Paris, the window for us to actually be able to meet two degrees is extremely tight. And that window is closing quickly. So quickly that many scientists wonder if we can meet it at all. We've squandered almost all of our carbon budget for two degrees centigrade, and therefore, we now face these dire political repercussions that are about today. Kevin points out that climate change isn't about 2100, or the next 50 years, because not only has it already arrived, due to the carbon budget we have left, it's really the next five years that will determine what kind of world we're left with for generations to come. You know, this conversation was tough for me, and I've thought about it a lot since, because the picture he paints is bleak, And I think for the first time in talking to Kevin, it really hit me how much we're up against and how much more urgency there needs to be if we're going to keep really terrible things from happening. But I keep thinking about something that Kevin said in this interview, that true hope, if there is any to have, comes from first dealing with the facts of the matter, no matter how bleak. And I think that's true. So in order to be prepared to push for the transformation that needs to take place within our society, We first need to look at where we're at. And Kevin is a great guide into exactly that question. So here's my interview with Kevin Anderson. I caught up with Kevin while we were in Paris for COP21. We got to the specifics behind what will need to happen in order for us to meet the goals that were set in Paris. But first, I started off by asking Kevin if he's been to these COP meetings before. I've only been to one, or one and a half, I should say. Um, I, I, don't, I don't fly, and, and therefore I'm a bit limited to which ones I can go to with, with sufficient degree of ease. So you, so you don't fly? I've not flown for 11 years, no. Um, but you, know, you, can, you can have a reasonable academic career still. You know, as an academic without flying, it's challenging. There are certainly certain parts of my life, some of which are professional, some of which are personal, which are more difficult. Um, but ultimately, from a professional point of view, actually, I don't think it's that limiting. It depends exactly what your research area is. Uh, I still travel. A reasonable amount um, but when I go I tend to plan it a lot more in advance and I go for longer because it takes longer to get there so I plan to do much more when I'm there so I don't tend to go for short one day events or three even two or three day events I generally tend to go I'll, I'll say well I, I can do this 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 and then I'll plan something for say a week or a fortnight or maybe a month sometimes and why have you made this decision basically two reasons but they're obviously both related it's, it's a carbon dioxide emission reason I work on climate change And one of the conclusions I draw from mine and others' research is that those of us who are responsible for the lion's share of emissions have to make very dramatic changes to how we live our lives to reduce our emissions. Now, that in itself, you know, me making these reductions for my emissions, 
is not necessarily important at, at a bigger picture level. But that I then try and discuss that with other people. It helps encourage a different way of, of viewing these things. So a lot of my colleagues take a different view towards their flying. I know lots of other academics now who think quite differently about flying than they did do before. So what you do is you catalyze, or you may catalyze a, a, a sort of change, a different mindset. So I think you can, as individuals, I think you can actually, you can be a real agent for change, but it's not just what the emissions are from yourself, it's actually how do you communicate that and you have to be quite vociferous and thick-skinned and stubborn, I think, to, to push these things forward. Thick-skinned? Thick-skinned means that you're going to get a lot of criticism. So have you? Oh yes, oh yeah, and particularly from, from other high-level colleagues who want to justify their incredibly carbon profligate lives, who spend half their lives on planes, um, and the more senior ones, half their lives on business class planes as well. And they, they, they don't like the idea you're questioning these things. So some people find it very uncomfortable. But also a lot of, I mean, academics across the board don't find that easy because they regularly like to go to conferences. There's, they will always say it's, it's, it's about the information and the knowledge. Actually, deep down, there is still something about flying as a positional good. It makes us feel good about ourselves because other people aren't doing it. Um, even though the flying itself is often quite uncomfortable. So I, I, I still think it, it, it has some symbolism of the sort of luxury of a particular group of society um, from the 1950s, even though the, in practice the flying is nothing like that anymore. But I think people who fly generally are people who are in that much wealthier category um, in society. So it says something about us as individuals, our success, because we measure our success generally in terms of wealth. Now, I've kind of thought about this question myself, um, and I remember something that Noam Chomsky said. I mean, it's, it's a slightly different example because it's not about emissions, but just in terms of like buying clothing or, or yeah, what, yeah. what we eat. And uh, he made the, the point that, well, Sure, to the degree that it doesn't take up all your energy, you can try to make good choices, but if you're spending all your time and energy trying to make the right decisions, then it's kind of a waste of effort because the effort should be going into changing the defaults of the system. What, what do you think about that? Well, it is both, but I don't, I don't see the system as separate necessarily from the individual. I don't really like this idea of top-down or bottom-up. I agree with a lot of what Tom has said over many years on lots of issues, but I, um, I, I don't particularly like the division of society into top-down and bottom-up. I, I see if we do the, make the changes, if we then talk about that within our family group, our social group, our, our work community, if we discuss in universities with our you know, heads of school, our, our VCs or with our companies, with our bosses and so forth, we can discuss these things, we can try to um, catalyze and foster a system level change. Ultimately, of course, I agree, you have to get that system level change. But system level changes don't just emerge from, from, you know, from nowhere, They're, something triggers them. And we could be those triggers. Now, we may well fail when we try to do this, but even when we fail in trying to catalyze change, we may have helped make someone else think about something differently. So we don't know where else their new ideas may, may percolate out to the system. Um, in this sense, it makes all seven billion of us stakeholders. Now we may approach this differently. Some people may prefer to take oil companies to court or to battle with their politicians. Others may prefer to demonstrate change themselves and try to catalyze that within their local environment and then say, look, hey, we've managed to do this as a community, as a, as a university, or whatever it might be. And the divestment movement is a very good example. You know, it emerged from some sort of little nugget and then it spread and now it's become much more white, you know, mainstream, it is becoming, you can, you can see the divestment movement helping make a system change. So I guess you're saying we need both strategies, or we, all types of strategies. We, we do need all types of strategies, yes. Um, but I don't like the idea of seeing that seeing it's just about individuals. I don't think, in, really in a complex system, individuals don't really exist. You know, we, we are all part of the system. So, and and we, are, we have the ability to catalyze change within our system. Now, one of the, uh, maybe you can explain it better and more fully than me after I'm done, but. So one of the primary things you do is you look at the, the official targets, like 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, yeah. and, then, and then sort of reverse engineer it and say, well, what would that mean to get there? Can you just describe uh, a bit about what that work involves? Yes. Um, well, we have these, I mean, let's just take the 2 degree C target. We have a 2 degree C, and I don't, I, I don't like calling it a target. I see it's an obligation or a duty. If you look at the language that was wrapped around it, it was never about a target. It was, we will take the action. Not we may take the action, we'll try and take the action. It's we will take the action to keep the temperature below two degrees centigrade. It doesn't say a 50-50 chance of or a 75% chance of exceeding. It says below two degrees centigrade. Is this the Consistent, Copenhagen Accord you're referring to? the Copenhagen to? Accord, but it could be the Camp David Agreement. It means almost every single year, governments sign up to the same sort of language. On the, consistent with science and on the basis of equity. I always use the Copenhagen Accord because it's the neatest encapsulation of this. But it's the same language that's used repeatedly. So I don't see it as a target. Um, I see it much more as an obligation or a duty. And I think that changes your perception of, of how important it is. So, but let's be clear, the two degrees C framing is not something that scientists derive. It is something that's, that came out of civil society. Science informs that, that debate. Science can tell you what the impacts might be at certain temperatures in certain parts of the world, that sort of thing. 
But whether that set of impacts are seen to be dangerous or not is the role of civil society and the sort of messy process of international negotiations. And unfortunately, that messy, messy process has been dominated, if we're blunt about it, by rich, white, generally men in the Northern Hemisphere. And we now have this target of two degrees C. And what we're hearing here in Paris is that there are many people around the world who think we should go, go for a lower target of one and a half. And, and they have a very legitimate case for that. Um, nevertheless, we've, we have this agreement around two degrees C, even though, as I say, it's, it's, it's two degrees C is likely to be dangerous and deadly for many of the poorer communities. It's then the role of people like me to take that and say, well, what does science tell us about two degrees C? What we'd need to deliver in terms of emission reductions? Now, the science tells us very clearly, and particularly the latest IPCC report, that for a temperature rise across the century, we have a set carbon budget, a total amount of carbon dioxide that we can emit into the atmosphere. And then we can, quite easily as scientists, we can start to translate to what does that mean in terms of the mitigation rates, how fast we have to reduce our emissions. We know what the current level of emissions are. We might make some assumptions about uh, emissions from, say, deforestation or from cement use. So we can then work out what's the emissions from energy, the bit I focus on. Um, so we might make certain sets of assumptions, but they can be very clear um, and obvious assumptions. You can adjust those a little bit up and down. But in the end of the day, we have a very clear carbon budget. And however you adjust these bits of detail, the same message comes out. We need rapid and deep reductions, probably bordering on the 10% per annum level. Well, yeah. Let me pick back up on that in a second, but first let me get this idea of the carbon budget straight. So basically we can calculate uh, more or less how much carbon we can collectively burn until we definitely go over that two degree line? Yes, yes. I mean there's a bit more to it than that, but yes. If we're talking about stabilizing atmospheric temperature of a two degree C rise by the end of the century, we have a set of carbon budgets. Now they vary a bit with the probability. Do you want a very good chance of it? So. Uh, well, it's not really a very good chance, but the best that we're using is a 66% chance of staying below 2 degrees C, or do you want a 50-50 chance, or just a 30% chance of staying below 2 degrees C, and they all have a different carbon budget associated with them. Um, and that is the total amount of carbon dioxide we can emit into the atmosphere between 2011 and 2100. Now, we could have done it earlier or later, but they, you know, that's, the, that's the budget range they've given in the IPCC report. Um, and we understand that fairly clearly, and there is a very high correlation between temperature and the total amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere. So when you crunch the numbers and kind of look at the carbon budget that would keep us below this threshold, what do you come away with? Okay, well, firstly, there's very little of the carbon budget left. Um, and the re that's one of the reasons that some of the arguments that I'm making look a little bit different to some of the other arguments you may hear here in, in Paris. Um, we are in now 2015, with the end of 2015, and the carbon budgets in the IPCC report are from 2011. So we've already emitted, since 2011, 150 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere. Now that's 15% that's of the budget for a good chance of 2 degrees C. Gone. So you always say, well that's already spent, you know, that, if you imagine it like a bank balance, that, that 15 pounds out of your 100 pounds in the bank has now gone. So um, we then have to say, well how much do we think we're going to use, in my case, because I focus on energy, I don't know how much we're going to use for the emissions from cement when we use cement. We, it emits carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the process of using cement. Cement is about the second most used material on the planet. We use it for wind turbine foundations, for nuclear power foundations, for roads, for rail networks. Almost all of our buildings have cement bases to them and of cement in the construction. Industrialization or the development, if you want to use that term, for the poorer parts of the world will also involve lots and lots of cement. So I then look at that, how that may play out in the future. And cement emits a lot of CO2? Or? Yeah, it does actually. You require a lot of energy to make the cement, but that could be low carbon. But the process emissions, the actual process, the chemical process of making cement, releases huge quantities of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So I've tried to take account of those, being very optimistic about what the technology can do to change it. And so I take account of that. I also take account of the emissions from deforestation, which is still ongoing, even though we could do something about it. But nevertheless, it is ongoing and it is likely to remain ongoing for the next few years at least. So we make some estimate of all of these. And then we reduce that from the carbon budget as well. So the carbon budget that we have in the end, um, the, the headline budget that comes from the IPCC is, is a thousand billion tons of carbon dioxide across the century and we would say well that's really now no more than 650 you know, which is already a 35% reduction. Now that makes a big difference to what your analysis tells you. And how much carbon are we burning a year right now? About 36, 37, something like that, billion tons of carbon dioxide. So at the, at the current rate, we use, it would take about under 20 years. At current consumption rates, it would be under 20 years. And, and then the budget would have gone completely. We can also then look at where does that budget come from, who, who are the people you know, burning that, that carbon dioxide, and we can understand that either from a country level, which I understand it, with a reasonable level, of, well, a very good level of detail, so how much of it is in the EU or the US or, the, or China or Tanzania or whatever it might be, so we understand that fairly well. Um, or the recent, some very recent work that's been done by Chancel and Piketty, which actually says, and also a report from Oxfam whilst we've been here, says, well, who does it come from? 
and they show that 50% of the emissions come from 10% of the population. They show that the top 1% of emitters in the US have emissions that are 2,500 times higher than the bottom 1% globally. So you can then start to say, well, it's not just about national boundaries, it's actually about the people who are high emitters, and we can identify who they are quite well. So you know, looking at those sorts of things can help you understand what the policies would have to be, either at a national level or beyond that, to think about how do you develop policies that focus particularly on these high emission, emitting people. So that's the sort of work that I'm, I'm involved with. So it, it sounds like that involves a, a lot of thinking about power then. It, it does. I mean, even if, you know, even if you only think about it from a mathematical sense, you can say, here's a particular group who have very high emissions. And if their emissions are so high, you think, well, it doesn't matter about the rest of the population. This is the group that really matters. Then, you know, that they are in positions of power, that they are very influential people is almost separate. If you're serious about two degrees centigrade, I can sort of say, well, if two degrees C has to be achieved, I have a certain carbon budget, these people are responsible for the lion's share of that carbon budget. I have to say that we have to come up with mechanisms that will bring the emissions down from that particular group. So if you like, the maths force you, forces you into questioning these issues of power. Um, and it may well be that these particular groups, and it, well, it is the case that these particular groups will respond to certain, certain types of policies differently to how other groups may respond, which is one of the reasons I'm not a great advocate of a simple carbon price. Because? Um, because if you put, a, at least the way that most people have thought about carbon prices, if you put a carbon price on, on energy, the price of energy goes up, but people like me and the high emitters are inelastic to the price of energy. If our flights go up the price by 25%, so what? We still fly. If our car fuel goes up by 25%, we just drive the same large cars. We don't significantly change what we do. The price of carbon goes up. That means the price of fertilizer goes up, because that takes a lot of energy to make fertilizer. That means the price of food goes up, which means the poor people can buy less food. If the price of energy goes up. People in 20% of all houses in the UK are in fuel poverty. That means they cannot heat the houses adequately in the winter. Their children have bron bronchial conditions as a consequence. If the price of energy goes up, their children have worse bronchial conditions because they can't heat their house as well. So there's a real equity implication of price. So I think we have to think, we have to certainly have to think beyond a simple, let's just add a carbon price and that, that would be enough. It will be very inequitable. And actually, I don't think it will really drive the emissions down very significantly in terms of behaviour and so forth, because most of the high emitting people like myself um, are fairly inelastic to the price of energy. It may help us move our energy systems from, say, uh, coal towards gas, or if the price was high enough, maybe you know, towards renewables. But it has to be a very high carbon price. But then you sort of say, well, that has these other imp impacts elsewhere. And that's why I'm saying the policies need to be much more subtle and nuanced than a simple carbon tax. Well, we talked to uh, James Hansen uh, the other night, and he was talking very specifically about doing a revenue neutral yeah, carbon, uh, carbon tax. Yeah, yeah. I think actually, oddly enough, I, although I've, been, I've really been quite opposed to a price mechanism for a long time, including emissions trading I don't particularly like. Nevertheless, I think, I think the, the idea popularized by Hansen, I don't think it was his originally, but I mean, that idea of fee and dividend, is, it's, when you initially look at it, it's quite attractive. The, the idea that if you consume more energy and, the, or car, and therefore emit more carbon, that you would pay a large sum of money for that, and then that money is distributed out evenly across all of society, helps overcome some of the equity implications of, of a high carbon price. There is the practical part of that. Can you imagine applying that globally? Could you imagine the US saying, we're happy to see huge amounts of money going to Ghana or Nigeria or wherever else it would be? So I think at a global level, it becomes quite challenging to know how you would apply that. But at a national level, it's more. But at a national more. level, you could, you could imagine it being played, applied at, well, I would like to think you can imagine it being applied at national level. I'd be interested to know whether in the States that would be the case, whether in fact they're very influential. I mean, you can imagine you know, the, uh, the, the Republicans or indeed you know, the, the Democrats as well. These would be that very high emitting group. And if they're serious about two degrees C, the carbon price would be huge. It wouldn't just be 10, 20, 50 dollars. I would think if we're serious about two degrees C carbon budgets, that carbon price would have to be in the hundreds and hundreds of dollars. If you're, you know, to meet the carbon budgets that we have. And remember, it's the policymakers who would have to pay that very high carbon tax who would have to pass it as well, because they're the ones that are going to be the high emitting group. Well, what would you say to people who say that, you know, two degrees of global temperature rise, that doesn't actually sound like that much? Well, coming from uh, the northwest of the UK, two degrees C sounds quite pleasant. We'd like a bit of warming, really. Um, but then you start thinking, well, yeah, but yes, but what does it really mean globally? It is a very significant temperature increase. Two degrees C is a global average. That's about six degrees in the poles. So that means we will melt the Arctic for a considerable period of the year. So these are, it's a huge temperature rise. But also, we don't live in global averages. We live in weather. We don't live in climate, we live in weather. And you have to then ask, well, what would these global averages of two degrees C mean for the extreme weather events? They're the ones that cause us real problems. When we see extreme weather, that would, there would be a climate signal on top of that. And you start to think, well, that would be a considerable additional flooding in some parts of the world, droughts, 
prolonged heat waves, changes in food patterns, changes in the rainfall around the planet. And we all, we all have learned to live with our current climate. Our infrastructures have evolved. You look at someone like a lot of Europe, not continental Europe particularly, the infrastructures have evolved over hundreds of years of a particular form of climate. Um, and so when that climate changes and when you start to get these extreme weather events, our infrastructures have not been developed for that. And that's not just our technical infrastructures, but our social infrastructures, like our agricultural framing and all of that sort of thing. So actually two degrees C is not this, you know, on a cold day in Manchester sounds quite pleasant. It's nothing like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it is a fundamental change in the shape of our planet in many respects. If you head to something like four degrees C, it's almost like another planet. I mean, it's, it's living somewhere that looks very different and feels very different to the world in which we live. And also we have to be careful that the two degrees C, the Northern Hemisphere, we like to think that we can you know, I think that we can probably just buy our way out of it. I still think many of the poorer people in the, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere will still struggle at 2 degrees C. Um, will certainly struggle a lot at 2 degrees C. But the poorer people in the climatically vulnerable parts of the world, 30 million people living on the coastal strip of Bangladesh within a meter of sea level rise and, and already susceptible to uh, typhoons that will increase in severity and possibly frequency with increased climate change, their lives are going to be made even, even more unbearable. So people who are already struggling with the current climate are going to find their lives much more challenged. Yeah, and let's be really clear and blunt about this. Many millions of people will die if we don't do something about climate change. You know, two, three, four degrees C, we are talking about millions and millions of people, possibly billions of people being affected, but, and certainly it's the high temperatures, and millions of people will be very seriously affected and many of those people will die. So whilst we might think we can get away with it in, in some parts of the US or in the, in the UK or in the Netherlands, wherever it might be, you know, we have to accept the fact that many people will suffer the implications of this and are already suffering the implications of just a one degree temperature rise. One degree is what we have so far? It's one degree is about the warming that we've seen so far, yes. So uh, if uh, we're talking about millions, potentially billions of people being affected, why do you think we've responded collectively with mostly a shrug? Because, the, because we're not prepared to question our current economic and political paradigm. We, are, we, ha we have this particular way of viewing the world and that, that has become so dominant. It's more important than physics and maths. So, you know, it was almost like, you know, set down by God, this is how the world has to be and you must not question it. And the scientists feel constrained by the fact that they, they feel they can't really question this. So they were always trying to fine tune certain sets of assumptions to make sure it delivers within the current political paradigm. Our policymakers like it because it means they haven't got to put forward to, you know, very stringent policies. We like it as a, as a scientific community because we can carry on flying to our nice climate change conferences all around the world. The public like it because they can carry on going on their holidays and buy their cars and not have to worry about this sort of agenda. Um, you know, when we think about carbon, it's in every facet of our life. It's in the, it's in the dyes that make up my coat here. It's, it's how we travel to this event here. It's uh, in the varnish that's on the, on the seats that we're sat on now. Every part of our life has been influenced by carbon, fossil fuel based carbon. And we're talking about trying to take that out of the system in 20, 30, 40 years at the very outside, maybe 20, 30 years. This is a huge challenge. We've never faced anything like that, let alone faced it when you've got 7 billion people on the planet. Um, and you put all of that together, you know, and tie that in with our current economic paradigm. No one wants to, no one really wants to stand up and say, I'll start to show some leadership on this. I'll start to you know, make the sorts of changes that are necessary. And even the NGOs have been co-opted really in this. You know, much of the time, they're all part of the same quite upbeat, optimistic view that technology in the future will solve the problem for us. And as an engineer, I really wish that was the case. You know, I spent a lot of my life working on large pieces of engineering equipment, designing and constructing them. And I, I wish we could simply engineer our way out of this problem. Engineering is an important part of getting out of this problem, but it is nowhere near enough. It has huge social, political, moral, and philosophical repercussions now because we've left engineering, it so late. like geoengineering. You mean? Um, I just no, simply just just you know, engineering in terms of things like renewable energy. I mean, that's a big engineering task. You know, if, if you think you know, nuclear power is very low, it has lots of other problems with it. But you know, again, that's a big engineering task. Um, engineering. Uh, low carbon transport networks, improving rail networks, building houses that are, that are very low energy consumption or zero energy consumption, hopefully even generate energy. All of this is engineering that we should be doing. Um, I wasn't particularly thinking about geoengineering or negative emission technologies. I think they're, they're part of the problem. Um, but people, people think we can do all of this engineering very quickly. I was in an event today and someone was saying, well, we can just do it all with renewable power. I'm all for renewable power, but just be realistic. We cannot build enough renewable power to um, to get us off the, off the curve or down to the curve that would be necessary for two degrees centigrade. It's just not, we just can't physically do that. And therefore in the interim, because we've left it so late, we have to reduce our levels of energy demand. The wealthy of us have to make very significant reductions. If we started this in 1990 when the first IPCC report came out, a quarter of a century ago, um, I don't know how old you are, but it's probably, you were probably very young a quarter of a century ago, we've had all of that time to do something about it. So virtually all of your life, 
People of my generation have chosen to do absolutely nothing about climate change. A quarter of a century, worse than doing nothing, we've actually watched the emissions go up. So this year the emissions will be 60% higher than they were a quarter of a century ago. That shows how much we've cared about climate change. We have this carbon budget, we've squandered most of it by our complete inaction, and now we face these challenges that we don't like. You know, tough. If we're serious about 2 degrees C, if we're serious about trying to you know, keep a world within which is a reasonable place to live, then what we face now is the repercussions of our complete inept failure over the last 25 years. And we just have to bite the bullet and make those sorts of changes. Or we, we pass on an awful legacy to the next generation. So, so you mean even if we were to take all the policies that people would be advocating with building renewables and uh, you know, putting in a high carbon tax or whatever, even then we couldn't reduce it fast enough, you don't think, just with building, building solar and wind? No, nowhere near fast enough. No. Just because of the, the lag time? Yeah, because of the lag time. But don't we just think solar and wind, right? Both, I'm really for solar and wind, they're, and they're wonderful technologies, their price is really coming down. How do you fly your planes with those? Are you going to power all your ships traveling around the world with solar and wind? How about all the car infrastructure? Is that going to go overnight to solar and wind? You know, electricity is 20% of the energy we consume. 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity. Now, fine, we can convert a lot of that to electric and then make it more renewable. But the, yeah, that does not, that's not a five minute job, building a, a grid network that is three, four, five times bigger than one we have today, that can deal with some of the intermittency issues, which have been exaggerated by some people. But nevertheless, there's a different performance structure to a um, performance output from renewable type power to the sort of typical thermal power stations we've been more used to. So what, what makes up the, the other 80% then? Transportation mostly or what? Oh, well, gas for heating, transportation, our aircraft, our ships, um, industry requires lots of you know, direct energy use, you know, there's gas, sometimes coal. Um, sometimes oil. So uh, that's 80% of the energy is not electricity. And I think most people forget that. And, they all, and a lot of the NGOs forget that. And they talk about energy and, and electricity as if they're the same thing. They both begin in E and end in Y, but they're quite different. Now we can electrify a lot of the other part of the system, but that is not a five minute job. You know, that is going to take us quite a lot of years to do that. And even if we had, as I often call it, a Marshall style plan, which is like the reconstruction after the Second World War, if we were that concerned about climate change and we really put all of our efforts into, into constructing a low carbon physical infrastructure, that will still take us too long for the carbon budgets that we have left. So it is a prerequisite, we have to do that, but we also therefore have to reduce our energy consumption in the short term, and whilst we reduce our energy, energy consumption, and the energy is primarily fossil fuel, we will reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. So you're saying there's a huge cognitive dissonance even among people who are really involved with this issue? Oh yes, I mean I often use that as a, in, in, in my slides, this idea of a cognitive dissonance, or a, I say a fancy academic term for hypocrisy a lot of the time. As many of us are actually aware of this. But having said that, many people also are not. I mean, a lot of climate scientists work in their particular area of climate science. They're not experts in the broader issues of mitigation or the broad issues of climate change. I'm in that fortunate position where the sort of job I have requires me to engage with experts right across the realm. So whether it's people who look at um, some of the detailed carbon cycle feedbacks or whether it's other people looking at, at behavior and psychology and social theory around how people respond to certain signals, price signals, I, I have to look at that full breadth of issues. And I think you get quite a different view as, as to how big the challenge is when you do that. But quite a lot of scientists I know, they occasionally peer out from their area of, of really detailed expertise and they make quite often naive assumptions about the world outside. Um, now, whether you call that cognitive dissonance or whether you just call that, you know, it, it's a misplacing of expertise really. What, what are those naive assumptions about the world outside? Well, often about how fast you can put technologies in place. So a lot of scientists I engage with really, I get the impression that they've never really done any engineering. They've never been involved in any building anything. It takes a long time to build something. I think they think what they see in their textbook can be simply be delivered almost at the press of a button. But you know, you've got to go through planning, you've got to recruit people, you've got to train people, you've got to find the right part of the country where you can actually try and do that. You've got to build the infrastructure around it. You've got to you know, close roads to put large pieces of equipment in place. You've got to dig pipelines that go under sites of special scientific interest in the UK that have a certain legislation around them. So you know, all of that takes years. And you don't just do it one power station or two power stations or 30 power stations or one or two new train lines. You're doing it across the full swathe of infrastructure, trying to convert it all to low carbon in 20 to 30 years. Now that is a Herculean engineering task. And I think a lot of people simply underestimate that. So, so we can use carbon capture and storage. We can use you know, all of these other renewable technologies. They take a long time to put in place. Solar is interesting and it, it's been put out much quicker than, than anyone expected. And it's much cheaper. And, uh, and I'm not saying we can't do things much quicker. And I'm very much in favor of us shifting towards renewables like there's no tomorrow. All I'm simply saying is, even when we do the best we could possibly imagine, it's nowhere near enough to get us to the two degree C carbon budget. And if we're serious about two degree C, therefore in the interim, we have to reduce our energy consumption. It can go back up again when we have low carbon energy supply. We can go back to all of the inequalities and all the other things that we have in our lives if we think that's really worth having. There may be sustainability constraints, 
But from a carbon perspective, what you want, you've got low carbon supply, you can consume as much as you want. But up until that point, you have to stay within the carbon budget, and that means we have to use less energy. And so what would that look like? Well, if you think about people, probably most of the people at the COP, maybe not everyone, but a lot of us here, we're probably in that top 10% of emitters, by and large. And how did most people get here? I get, guess a huge number of people here flew. The ones who somehow think that they're somehow more valuable than our society, they'll have no doubt flown business class. And there'll be a few stars who will no doubt have turned up here first class or in private jets. All of that would have to go. You know, far fewer people would arrive here. We'd have to have virtual conferencing links back to other parts of the world so that people could actually engage via their own, in their own countries. We'd have to develop those infrastructures for virtual conferencing that were much more successful than the ones we have today. The people that did come here would have to come here by very low carbon means of transport, you know, or by ways that can at least be made low carbon, like trains, unlike planes, which really are locking ourselves into a very high carbon future. Um, when we go home, we would have to start living in smaller houses, generally, you know, the wealthier ones. We would, we would have to heat our houses probably less than we do, and maybe not air condition them as much. Um, we'd have to drive smaller, more efficient cars. We'd sometimes have to share, share lifts with people. A radical idea. Imagine a car with five seats having more than one person in it. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine when you look at Europe nowadays or the US, you have a big car, there's only ever one person in it. We have to find some way out of this that we, we start to, to learn to be more, not necessarily more communal, but, but at least more, more aware of the energy we use when we try and do something. At the moment, when you think about when we travel short distances, what do we do? We get 90 kilograms, in my case, 93 kilograms of flesh. You get in a car that weighs 1,500 kilograms and you drive seven kilometers to pick up some groceries. You know, in 2015, can we not find a better way to pick up 10 kilograms of groceries than having to transport 1,500 kilograms of metal to a supermarket and then bring it back again? But if that's necessary right now, we have a pretty big gap there from what is politically even anywhere feasible and what you're saying is necessary that we do right this minute. And even if that gap is somehow closed, that will take a long time to what? close that political gap. Um, we will choose, for it to, I think, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to succeed at this. I mean, we cannot guarantee we will fail because we haven't tried. If we tried, we may well find that we don't succeed. But if we don't try, we're guaranteed to fail. And therefore, although you say it's a huge political void, if we are serious about two degrees centigrade, we have to acknowledge that and say we are going to deal with it. Otherwise, let's be honest and say we're not going to aim for two, we're going to aim for three or four and just tell the poor people elsewhere in the world, well, forget it, we're not worried about your future. That's, we just let us be honest about that. That's really the underlying text from Paris. We don't really care about the poor and vulnerable elsewhere. Um, and we have a loss and damage you know, budget of 100 billion, which is irrelevant, really, in terms of either, either quantity or what we'll be able to achieve. Um, so the real message coming out of something like this is the wealthy parts of the world who are responsible for the lion's share of the emissions, or even the wealthier within the poorer parts of the world as well. We, did, we just don't care about the people who are going to be impacted by climate change. That's the real take-home message. That's a level of honesty uh, that also doesn't seem very feasible. Well, it's a, it is a level of honesty. I mean, OK, so we, we, what we're always saying then is that we can only carry on by being dishonest. I mean, I, I think humanity can be more than that. I think humanity can be honest. I think humanity can make very significant changes. I mean, even just a very simple thing to put a bit of maths on some of this. If we took the top 10% of the global population, not the other 90%, the top 10% of high emitters, and they, these are around the globe, significant in the US and the EU and so forth, but also you know, a significant number of people in China and India as elsewhere. But let's imagine that top 10% could reduce their emissions down to the level of the average European. Now, that's not impoverished. That's, you know, that's not a bad quality of life, the average European. And they could achieve that in a year. That would be a 30% reduction in global emissions. And all we require in there is the top 10% of emitters to live a life of an average European in terms of energy consumption. Yeah, I think they could achieve that in a year. They wouldn't like it. That would mean they would have to have only one or two flights a year, and they would probably maybe only one flight a year. They'd have to start living like an average European lives. But that isn't an impoverished life. That isn't struggling to live. But isn't that a lot of, uh, isn't it a lot of it from just the built-in infrastructure and way things have been designed? Well, not really. I don't, I mean, the, the top 10%, are there, not because of the infrastructure, they're using the same infrastructure you'd be using. When they're on the road, one person might be travelling on that road on a bus, one person might be travelling along that road on a bike, another person might be travelling in a car that does 100 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometre, or the American car that's averaging 220 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometre. So there are huge different ways, all travelling along the road, all travelling the same seven kilometres to pick up their groceries or whatever they're going to do. There are huge differentials about, about that. Is that. That infrastructure is the same infrastructure, same road, same grocery shop at the end. People do the same things using very different levels of energy. What I'm simply saying here is if two degrees C is a serious issue, then let's be just honest about it. We can do a huge amount by a significant, by a small group of people, but it's still significant, a small group of people, 10%, making reduction levels that are compatible with the average European. I'm not saying the average Nigerian or the average Ghanaian. I'm talking about the average European. That's a fairly high quality of life. Now, if we cannot be even bothered 
to say that the people responsible for 50% of global emissions can even be bothered to make that level of reduction, then OK, let's accept the fact 3 or 4 degrees C, let's tell the poor we don't care about their futures, we'll pretend a little bit, but if we're honest about it, we don't really care, and we can just get on living our lives and enjoy it whilst, you know, whilst the sun shines and let the temperatures keep going up. But I would, I would prefer some direct honesty in all of this. I, I heard you say in a talk that uh, one of the primary things that people misunderstand is that it's not about targets even in like 2050, it's about right now, like the next five years that will determine whether or not we even have a, a chance of getting to two degrees. Oh, Can yes, you talk yeah. About, yeah. about that? Okay, well, this, this comes back to this idea of about carbon budgets. For a long time, people have actually focused on these long-term targets. Like 80% by 2050. by 2050, yeah. So that's the sort of argument we've had in the UK. We've had that enshrined in law in the UK. An 80% reduction by 2050. An 80% reduction by not in my term of office. That's what the politicians see it as. Or an 80% reduction by I can carry on flying as a climate scientist or as a member of the public or whatever. You know, it feels far away. It feels a long way away. A technology in 2030 and 2040 will solve the problem for us. The problem is there's no science to that. The science has told us very clearly we have a carbon budget. If we'd started to act a long time ago, we would have we could we could have introduced more sort of gradual policies and so forth. We have squandered almost all of our carbon budget for two degrees centigrade, and therefore um, we now face these these dire political repercussions that are about today. Because in five years from now, we'll effectively have wiped out any chance for two degrees centigrade if we do not do something very significant from a policy perspective over the next few years that start to bring our emissions down. Then the two degrees centigrade um, framework has basically gone. So we haven't got another five years to wait to whatever, wherever the next, the COP will be in five years time for another grand event, too late. You know, we have, Paris is the last major COP where we have any opportunity to do something on two degrees C. And we're not even there, we're still talking about a very thin pro pro probability now. So the reason it shifted from a 20 and 80% reduction by 2050 to actually these carbon budgets is that the carbon budgets are the scientific way to think about temperature. Um, this way of delaying action and until some technology will solve the problem in 2050. That means the carbon dioxide emissions keep rising in the atmosphere. And that's all that matters for climate change, you know, the, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. So whether we, we keep pumping CO2 in the atmosphere and make some big reductions in 2030 or 2040 or 2050, too late. The carbon dioxide is there, changing the atmosphere, changing the climate for the next 100 to 10,000 years. So, and because we've left it so late, we, we have this very small carbon budget now, and that's why it, it, it comes, you know, it's incumbent on the current generation to do something about it in the next few years. So if, if this is the case, though, why do we so seldomly hear this in, in the press or even at places like yeah. this? We do hear it a little bit in the press, but not that often. One of the reasons for this is that this a particular technology, well, that's unfair, it's not technology because it doesn't work as yet. There is a prospect of a future technology which will suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So that is now embedded in almost all of the main models that are informing governments. Not the, the detailed climate models, not the physics models that look at climate, but the models that combine that physics with economics and behavior and politics and these sort of what are called integrated assessment models. These models are the ones that inform the policymakers. They're called cost optimizing models. They work out what's the cheapest way of holding the two degrees centigrade. And they almost all show the same thing, which is the technology we don't have now if that comes into place in 2050 to 2070 and sucks the CO2 out of the atmosphere, sucks the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, then we don't have to make such big changes today. And so we're pinning our hopes on a technology that doesn't really exist yet? Yes, yeah. Um, oh yes, without a doubt, that's what, that is the underpinning of almost everything being discussed in Paris. All the discussions about the INDCs, saying the INDCs are 2.7 degrees or 3 degrees, all of that is premised on assuming we can suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere a long time in the future. No one even talks about it now. That, that technology that does not exist is just assumed to work and it's been completely normalised. And it, a lot of climate scientists are, particularly the, sort of the natural scientists and some of the physicists are really very concerned about this, but they're not quite so vociferous yet in, in voicing that concern, though that is changing. I mean, here it's changing in the big climate change conference from the scientific community that was in June in Paris, actually, this year. There are lots of people there really genuinely deeply concerned about these integrated assessment models and their reliance on this technology that doesn't exist a long time in the future. Dr. Strangelove, I don't know if you've ever seen the film, but I was thinking of it as a Dr. Strangelove technology. It may work, but the idea to assume that it will work is really very dangerous. And what do you think the effect of this built-in assumption is? Is it, is it dangerous that everyone has this built-in assumption? Well, it's incredibly dangerous because what it allows us to do is effectively use an incremental adjustment to, to business as usual. It allows us to carry on, smile at these events, pat each other on the back, and leave here on a plane to go home once we've got the taxi to the airport and live in our biggest homes because, because negative emissions in the future, we just turn the dial up and that'll suck the CO2 out. Okay, we have to make some adjustments. We have to gradually move towards renewable energy and maybe um, eliminate fossil fuels in the system in the next 
70, 80, 90 years that some people have been talking about and from the IPCC have been talking about as well. You know, this doesn't fit at all with a two degree C framing unless you can suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it fundamentally changes what we're prepared to talk about here. And, and even the idea that people say well, the INDCs are in line with 2.7 degrees, you know, that, that, is, that is repeated here in many venues. Yet the people who are saying that never understand or virtually never understand that behind that is an assumption that huge amounts of carbon dioxide are, are going to be sucked out of the atmosphere in years to come. And a very common technology for that planned technology is something called BECS, Biomass Energy Carbon Capture and Storage. And they're going to plant places like, you know, they could be huge. Some of these scenarios assume places as big as India or larger, planted with biomass and captured every year and then harvested every year, transported around the world to power stations, burned in power stations, the carbon dioxide captured, liquefied, pressurized, and put down into a reservoir somewhere under the, under the ground and held there for a thousand plus years, safely without leaking, more than a thousand plus years, safely without leaking. That's the premise. That's what we're assuming is going to occur. At the same time, we're trying to feed seven to nine billion people on the planet. The aviation sector thinks it's going to use biomass for flying the planes. The shipping industry thinks it's going to use biomass for powering its ships. The car industry is using, already using biomass, um, and the chemical industry thinks it will use biomass for um, chem chemical feedstock. So you've got all the sectors thinking, oh, we're going to use this biomass, this magical fuel that's going to save, save the world. You know? um, and people need to sit back and think, we've got a round planet. We've got changing temperatures. We've got seven to nine billion people. We've got, you know, we have this changing climate. Is this in any way realistic? And lots of the people now, lots of scientists are saying, no, it's not. And there are some papers now coming out suggesting this looks incredibly dangerous set of assumptions to, to build our current policies on. Is this what you mean when you talk about how uh, there's a bias even within the scientific community of kind of tweaking the numbers so that we get a conclusion that is palatable, that we can yes. digest? Yeah, very much so. I mean, there are a number of ways we do it, but that is the most powerful one that is used. I mean, another one is that we, we assume global emissions will peak very early. So quite a lot of the scenarios in the IPCC assume global emissions have already peaked. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, a lot of them. I mean, a lot of the scenarios. And the UNEP gap report, um, and a lot of the scenarios there, I've assumed global emissions have already peaked. So you know, we have this one where we're going to use lots of negative emissions. We also assume a very, very early peak, or possibly a peak in the past, which is even more challenging. Um, there's often a, a very naive assumption on the uptake of technologies, how rapidly they can penetrate the system. Now, they can do a lot with technologies, but we have to be more realistic about how they can be factored in and what, what that would actually mean. You know, we, do we have enough people trained to do these things? Or can we, have to move, can we move them off other things that they're doing and move them on to you know, pushing forward a very low carbon agenda? I just don't think people really think this through on a, on a sort of system level basis. They do it with their algorithms and with their computer models and their equations. And I think there's, there's a real danger in that. It's, it's non, I call it non-contextual. You know, they, they don't really step outside and look at the world within which they live and say, well, how would you, how would you deliver that here in the next few years? But it allows us by adjusting those assumptions, it allows us to fit within the current political discourse. And again, that's the one that you hear. You hear that sort of language, green growth. You know, we can have our cake and eat it. You hear that repeatedly. It's just rubbish, you know, win-win opportunities. There are some win-win opportunities here and there, but by and large, we're going to have to make such large changes that the way we would normally measure these sorts of successes in our society, you know, will, will not be successes. You know, that we would measure that as being not so positive. So things like economic growth, we will probably have to question whether that's viable in the short to medium term for the wealthy parts of the world. Certainly the wealthy people within the wealthy parts of the world, that is unlikely to be viable. Well, almost certainly will not be viable in the two degree C framework. You know, people will have to take a significant economic hit. Their positional goods, the way that they see themselves in society will have to change. Now, it doesn't mean we have to have a low quality of life, we can still have a very high quality of life, but those adjustments, at the moment we would measure those things as not, or see those things as not being particularly positive. I'd be curious what it's like for you personally to work in this area, uh, especially without a lot of the comforting assumptions that uh, other scientists or, or people in the uh, environmental movement use. I imagine uh, that can't be, be easy, because just thinking about that last point, well, how likely is it politically that the most powerful people and nations in the world are suddenly going to say to themselves, we can't grow our economies anymore? Yeah, um, very few of them. Um, and that's partly because we've, we've been become dominated by a particular group of economists. That, that, this wasn't the same 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, they dominate every facet of our lives now, whether, whether that's in, in governments, whether it's in universities, whether it's in our schools. I mean, everywhere our lives are dominated by a particular way of looking at the world. And that, and that, but that's new and that is constructed. We don't have to have it like that. There are ecological economists out there look at the world differently. There's people like Herman Daly, very influential, used to be in the World Bank, Stiglitz of this world or the Piketty of this world. There are people questioning some of these things. So it is being questioned a little bit now, this, this particular economic paradigm that we have. Um, but what is it like for you personally? For me personally? Because, I mean, you obviously have to contemplate a lot of scary scenarios. Yeah. And there are two ways. Firstly, from a personal point of view in terms of 
being isolated. I don't feel quite so isolated. I feel there are lots of other people now saying these sorts of things. Now, often they won't say them publicly, and they'll use a form of language which is slightly different to mine. I quite appreciate the fact that you have to have a, yeah, we all communicate in the way that we think is most appropriate for us. I do think it has to fit with the science. Um, and you know, I, some people might argue my language is slightly more colorful. I think the adjectives I use fit very well with the numbers. Um, so I don't feel I'm misusing the adjectives. I think you know, if numbers look dire, then I would use, I use the adjectives that say it's dire. Um, but other colleagues find that slightly harder to do, and they will you know, use slightly different language. But nevertheless, there were quite, I mean, the event that was at today, I think some of the colleagues on the, on the stand, I don't think five years ago they would have said the things they were saying. Um, and I hear that from not just from early career academics, I hear that from quite a lot of senior academics who are saying things that are really quite challenging for society. I mean, you know, as a very clear example of someone who's held up in high esteem in a place like Germany and, and oh, well, that's well across Europe, a bit like John Schellenhuber now is saying things that you know, are very difficult for our current economic framing of society. Um, you, know, you could argue the Pope's coming out and saying these things as well. So yeah, there are very senior people saying these sorts of things. The IMF you know, pointing out the huge subsidy for fossil fuels. The, the International Energy Agency coming out and saying we're aiming for 6 degrees C, that's our trend line and we're going to, that's with devastating consequences for the planet. The IEA saying that. So these there are established figures and institutions that are saying things that are fairly radical, as well as the sort of more detailed stuff that I and increasing numbers of people are saying. So it's much easier now than it was two or three years ago. Two or three years ago, I found it very difficult. So it's, it's not too challenging for me from that point of view. The way it is challenging is actually trying to live a world, live in a world where, I mean, the flying one is not easy for me. I think we should have to accept the fact it will not be easy. Um, academically, it's, it's less of a problem. It doesn't mean that I spend a bit more time away from home than I would like to do, and it takes a lot more organisation. And what about anxiety for the future? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of that. Um, but I mean, yeah, yes. And I think, but a lot of people in NGOs and elsewhere feel that as well. But and, and but it's a it is a, a rich middle class person's anxiety. A lot of people have anxiety around the globe, and they're worrying about the, you know, where the food comes from tomorrow, or what's going to happen to them two weeks down the line, or that huge flood in India. Now that's what they're dealing with. So and I'm it's still not, contemplating the end of the world, essentially. It is, but I'm not going to worry about my Western anxieties. I think I can I, I can deal with those. Um, you know, I think a lot of other people have got a lot more immediate anxieties, which maybe not the end of the world, but it's the end of their lives or their families' lives, or at least a reasonable livelihood. So you know, I'll I'll take that hit because I work in this particular area. I, I, I see these things. I don't find that a problem. But the personal things are like. Um, I have a lot. Of, I'm a keen rock climber. A lot of my rock climbing friends go away climbing for weekends or for the odd week here and there to Morocco or to somewhere in Norway for ice climbing in the winter. I can't join them because they just jump on a plane and off they go. So that has affected my friendships there. Um, uh, I have a, an uncle who I'm very close to who lives in Australia. A lovely man. I will never see him again. You know, that's not easy. He's he's old, not very well. I would love to see him. I've not seen him for 11 years, um, and I will likely never see him again. I can only talk to him or Skype him or whatever it might be. And that is not easy. So personally, that is very challenging. But if I go to see him, unless I can get there slowly, maybe if he's still around when I'm retired, then maybe I'll try and go to see him. But if I was to fly there, the emissions are so high from that, from that particular journey, I think, well, that will have an impact on poor people living in Bangladesh. Now, I don't know who, which one it will be over there, but it will significantly add to the burden for these people. And I can't justify that. So therefore, I, I, I can't go and see him. But couldn't you say that because you're working your whole life on, on climate change and trying to promote the types of actions required that that then it's justified in a way? And lots of environmentalists say that, lots of my scientific colleagues say that. In fact, I've not met anyone who doesn't think, well, very few people who don't think that. That somehow, and I talked, I mean, I found it very depressing when the second day I was here, I talked to a really good scientific colleague of mine, an excellent, an excellent scientist, and he said, um, I can justify flying here from a provincial town in the UK because I do good work on climate change. Yeah, I just think I, I haven't met anyone who doesn't think differently. The business community thinks it has to fly and has to have a larger amount of carbon dioxide because it feeds into um, prosperity in our society. It allows us to buy more expensive renewables as they see it. The aviation sector thinks it's the exception, important for growth, cultural development around the world. Shipping industry, essential for you know, moving of goods around the world. So there's two sectors that shouldn't be included and in fact are outside UNFCCC, have not submitted any INDCs and are under almost no control for their CO2 emissions. But then there's the climate scientists who think they should carry on because, hey, we're doing really good things. There's the environmentalists who think they're doing really good things. There's the business leaders who think they're doing good things. The politicians have to fly around the world because they're doing really good things. Where is this person that's going to compensate for everyone else's emissions? You know, I always joke that it's a, it's a small pet shop in Rotherham that's going to compensate for the rest of the world who think they're so important, they, are allowed, they should be allowed more emissions than anyone else. So I think we have to be very careful about this particular ruse that we use to justify our, our anyway, it's a cognitive dissonance issue. Uh, you know, we, we know deep down that's not what we should be doing, but that's quite hard to deal with psychologically. So we make, it, make out this point that we are the particularly important people. Uh, I don't think I'm that important that I should be flying around the world to try and solve climate problems. So you, and you've, uh, on that note, you also take a very negative stance to carbon offsetting. Can you explain why? 
Yes. Why can't why can't I pay for my flight by planting trees somewhere else? Yeah. Indulgences. So you don't think the science behind it is, is well, no, correct? No, I don't. There's a quite a number of reasons against offsets, and I'm not completely opposed to to them. I, mean, I think, well, in the way they're seen here, I certainly I am. Um, so say you plant trees, right? So you, you fly somewhere, you fly to you know, I don't know, New York to Paris to come to this conference, um, and in doing that, you plant a few trees. Your flight is guaranteed to emit a carbon dioxide because you're on the plane. You've also sent a very clear market signal that says, please buy some more planes and build more airports and those cannot be made low carbon in the future. And you're gonna compensate for that by planting a few trees, which you hope will suck the CO2 up over some period in the future. But that's, of course, that period in the future, how do you know that's gonna happen? How do you know there's not gonna be a movement in pests that mean those trees get killed by changing the climate, and bring around new pests? That's happening in the UK. A lot of pests, are, are lots, for lots of reasons, lots of trees are dying in the UK now. And because of, I'm not saying because of climate change, but because of changes in their natural environment, one way or another. Um, how do you know that, that in 20 years from now there's going to be some sort of problem with fuel in one part of the world where these trees are being planted, they get chopped down and converted into you know, just, just fuel for people to use? So it's the uncertainty of, about, yeah, about it? Said, yeah, but the uncertainty is there. Um, so, but it's more than just the uncertainty because what you have done is put the CO2 in the atmosphere and sent a market signal to expand that particular high carbon form of energy. And what you've done to try and compensate that is plant a very uncertain tree somewhere else. So, they're not comparable. That ton in the tree, which is very uncertain, is not the same as the ton you've guaranteed to have emitted, or the ton of CO2 that you're almost guaranteed to have embedded in the, in the expansion of the industry that you've supported. The other problem is that people say, well, can we not just um, you know, pay for uh, a wind turbine or a solar panel elsewhere? I'm all for us doing that, but not as an offset. So imagine that, we fly somewhere, and we buy, buy some solar panels for an Indian community, a village somewhere, wherever it might be, some poor village that didn't have power before. Great, they've got solar power. I'm all for that, they can access light, they can do extra reading, they can have a television or a radio. They have a television or radio, then they get advertising on the television or radio. You know, now that that's there, the, the advertising could be, buy a small petrol scooter so you can travel between the markets. Maybe you can get a small truck to move your goods from one market to another. Great, that's good for development, not really opposed to that necessarily. But that now means that they're now driving the scooter rather than using the ox or whatever it was they were doing before. And your emissions are still in the atmosphere from your flight. So what you've done over a longer period of time is to lock, help the other part of the world improve their development and therefore increase their amount of CO2 emissions in the short to medium term. That's not an offset. You probably increase the amount of CO2 emissions, so it's actually worse than doing nothing from a CO2 perspective. But that doesn't mean that I'm saying those people should not have a solar panel. I think we should not fly and we should pay for the solar panel. That's, you know, that's reparation. We are stopping them from developing the way that we developed because we think the carbon dioxide emissions will be too high. But at the moment, what we're saying, well, we want to carry on doing what we've done as well as benefiting from the fossil fuels in the past. We're going to carry on flying and everything else and we're going to pay the poor people elsewhere in the world to compensate for that. Uh, I think that at every level, scientifically, mathematically, and morally, it is reprehensible to be doing that. So you'd say it's worse than doing nothing? Oh, it's, in my view, it's much worse than doing nothing, yeah. yeah at, at lots of levels, you know, not just the scientific, the scientific way, mathematical way, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, but also the moral framing that that is an appropriate thing to do. You mentioned that you worked in the oil patch? Yes, I mean, I, I, I left school at 16 and worked, uh, did an apprenticeship as an engineer in the Merchant Navy, working on tankers and gas carriers and container ships. And then later on I did, a, I did an engineering um, degree and then I went to work in the oil industry, basically, basically as a design engineer, designing offshore oil platforms and then in the um, what's called the hookup and commissioning, the construction of the oil platform offshore and then partly in the operation of the oil platforms as well. So that was my sort of engineering history. Um, but I'm, I'm, I was always interested in energy and environmental issues right from being a child in next door to a nuclear power station where my dad used to work as a, as a fitter, so he used to work on the reactor. And I, think I was interested in those issues right back in the 1970s um, when people weren't thinking about climate change then, but we were thinking about alternative energy, it used to be called. So we were thinking about how would you go move away to alternative energy sources. So I, it's a long history. All my life I've had an interest in energy, um, really, thanks to my dad. And for some reason I had an interest in environmental issues, and I don't know where that quite came from, but that persisted. Whether I was working on the ships or whether I was working on the oil rigs, I was always involved in trying to make sure they did things as cleanly as possible. So we didn't release CFCs, which were a big issue when I was on the oil platform trying to say how can I restore the CFCs and put them back in the system when we're doing maintenance work. So I was always trying to look at it like that, and then I start, thought this climate change issue came along, this looks really serious, tried to understand the science, thought I need to go back to university and find out more, and I've been working on it ever since. What year was that? 90, I think it was the 19, early 1990s, 
So I mean, really early on when it oh was. Oh yes, hitting. yeah, yeah. It was, it was the very early days of sort of climate change being seen as a big. I mean, obviously people had worked on it before, but started, but when it was becoming a vogue issue, I was starting to read quite a lot about it. And I thought, actually, I don't know that much about climate change. I need to find out more. I did as much reading, reading as I reasonably could that was available in 1990. Um, and but thought, no, I need to go back to university and find out a bit more detail. And so that's what I did, and I've been working on it ever since. And was there was there like an article or something that you remember interacting with that really got you? thinking or concerned about it? No, I don't think it was. And actually, I don't think my life has ever really run like that. There's been one thing that's triggered, occasionally maybe, but generally it hasn't worked like that. It's, it's a sense of something. So, it, it, you know, you read bits and pieces and you think about it a bit more. I, I always think that thinking is very important. I, was, I, I get that with, with students. Yeah. Don't, the first thing is not to read. The first thing is to think. So I, I, I was thinking about a lot of issues then and trying to read about it. And I came to a judgment that this, this is likely to be an important issue. And the studies I did at university when I went back again looked to me that this was a very, very important issue. And you, I, you certainly made the, the right bet on that one. Yeah, well, unfortunately. Yeah, y yes, yes, unfortunately. I mean, I, I genuinely wish the skeptics were right. I think I wish the skeptics were right much more than them. I, I, would, I would very happily pack up my job and go back to doing something else I would much rather do. I really enjoy, miss my engineering, I really enjoy doing it. Um, I feel now I've developed a sufficient expertise in this area that I feel I'm sort of obliged to sit, stick with this area. I don't want to be doing this, I don't want to be in COP. I don't enjoy working on climate change particularly. I have some good colleagues, but it's not, it's not the sort of terrain that I feel particularly happy with. But I think it's a very, very important subject. And I'm lucky enough to have a set of expertise that, that has a role to play in it. So I feel some sort of moral obligation to work within this area now. But you know, that's the way it is. I still count myself, you know, I'm a lucky Westerner living a very comfortable life, so I can't complain. You mentioned how important it is that we peak, you know, basically as soon as possible to have even a, a chance. I just read a, an article in the BBC yesterday using research from East Anglica that said that we might have peaked this year or there yeah. might, might be down. Have you yeah. had a chance to look at that? And oh, what yes, do you I have. Yeah. In fact, that was a, the side event we ran today was with, with the Global Carbon Project. My colleague, Corinne Leclerc, works with the Tyndall Centre and the Global Carbon Project. She was involved in that. She did the press release and so forth yesterday. And we talked with Glenn Peters from Cicero in Norway, um, who was heavily involved in that project. So that, might, that sounds like great news, right? Oh, it's excellent news. It's really good news. Um, and let's hope it lasts. But when you then ask the same people, who are the, you know, the detailed analysts who understand it, you ask Corinne or you ask Glenn whether this looks like a, a, a change in the, um, in, in the trend, or at least it, does it look like a real peak? They don't think this is a peak in emissions. They think it is a, for various sets of quite detailed reasons, but significantly related to coal use in China and so forth, and, and also weather and, and hydro generation in China, looks like it's brought the emissions growth that we've been seeing, which typically has been about 2 to 3% per annum during this, since the millennia really, um, has brought it down to pretty much flat line for the last couple of years. But it's only about two years worth of data at the moment. So, and that's partly because of economics, you know, the economic, economic slowdown in China. It's partly because um, they've had a very lot, a large amount of rainfall which helped them with hydropower. But at the same time, they've built some more hydropower as well. And they've also closed some of their coal-fired power stations down. So you put all of that together, and it's because China is such a large part of the global emission profile, then it, um, emissions have slowed down. If you then say, well, do they think that's going to be long term? They think the, the conditions that, that have brought that about will not persist for a long period of time. Though it, it's still, I think it's fair to say, they also say it's unlikely to go back up to the sort of 2 to 3% per annum growth rate, but it's likely to go back up to the sort of 1% or maybe a bit more. Then they say that it could actually rise again by the time we got into the 2020s, if, say, India became the new renaissance, the new China. So as China moves towards a service economy, the rest of the world says, well, who's going to manufacture the goods for us now? Maybe it's going to be India or Indonesia or somewhere else. So um, at the moment, you know, they're very hesitant to suggest this is anything other than a small dip, but a very, you know, a very welcome dip. And let's hope it, let's hope it is at the peak in emissions. Let's hope it is a new trend. But I think we have to be very careful about taking two years worth of data and extrapolating it. And if we, could, if we could have this as the peak, and if we could bring our emissions down very rapidly, that would make things a little bit easier. But still, however you play it out, it's still going to be a very, a very hard ride for a series about two degrees C. Well, uh, to end off, I'd be curious what gives you um, hope and uh, resilience going forward, given all the, uh, you've kind of given us a lot of bad news today, Kevin. Um, so, so you're still working very hard on this issue, obviously, you're not giving up. So what gives you resilience going forward? Well, it's more of a moral framework, really. I mean, I, the science is sufficiently uncertain um, around exactly what, you know, what budget hits what temperature. We, we, we know we're in the reasonable realm, but we must not overplay the the exact precision we have in the science. So there's a little bit of flexibility in the science, not a lot, I mean, the science is all well understood and, and, and as far as I can tell, it's completely right. I mean, we, have it, we, have, we well understand climate change, we, we very clearly know 
why, the emissions are go why carbon dioxide emissions are going up in the atmosphere. We know from what sources they're going up and we know that it links to temperature, all that stuff we know. But exactly what the temperature rise will be for the, for the exact amount of carbon dioxide emissions, there's some, there's some uncertainty there. So that helps us. Um, we also have an opportunity to make the big political changes that would be necessary. So these are, these are all very small, you know, the door is slightly open on the science, the door is slightly open on the politics. Um, yeah, there's not much hope of us pushing hard against any of these. But if we did push really hard, we might push them quite a lot further open and we could perhaps then move to a different place, you know, a different paradigm, a different way of thinking of these issues. And that's what that, my, where my hope is really, is that whilst that thin thread of hope remains, and it's very thin, if I was a betting person, the chances are that we're going to fail. But whilst it remains, it's incumbent on people like me to do my damnedest to try and make sure we, we bring about those sorts of changes, the necessary changes. We are already too late for one and a half degrees C, and there are a lot of people are talking about it here, and I think I'm pleased that they are talking about it. And I've had discussions with my colleagues about whether that's a good or a bad thing, but I think politically, I think it's important that they're pushing hard for a lower temperature. Um, I don't think you can scientifically achieve that now. I think it's beyond, I mean, our carbon budgets have been blown for 1.5 degrees C, as far as I can tell. Um, and that means that we're aiming at two degrees C, and that means a lot of people who have had nothing to do with the problem will, be, will suffer the repercussions of our profligate use of carbon and knowing profligate use of carbon. So we have effectively in the West, or the wealthy part of the world anyway, we've been like a meteorite that has hit the planet knowingly with a conscience. So, or without a conscience maybe, we've knowingly hit the meteorite, but without a conscience, but that's a better way of seeing it. And I think that's wrong. I, think I find that morally, you know, just not, not appropriate to do that. And if I have some ability to try to change that a little bit, then that's what I try and do. But it isn't one of false hope. I don't think we're going to succeed. But I don't know we're going to fail. And that thin thread, that thin difference between thinking and knowing is, is what keeps me working on climate change. Well, is that what you mean when I saw in the talk that you said that it comes from dealing with just how bad things are, that we'll get any hope if there is any to get? Well, that, that was saying, no, that was the think, as I recall, that was saying that until we recognise how bad things really are, until we, until we recognise the situation we're in now, so it's a bare assessment of the scale of the challenge we face. Because a lot of people say, I, I take away all, the, all this hope. I'm not taking away hope, in my view. What I'm doing is trying to offer real hope. You have to say, where are we today exactly, precisely, bluntly? We need to understand the challenges we face. And then we can say, well, what can we do about it? But at the moment, we're not even prepared to accept where we are today. We pretend we're somewhere else already. So you know, in Paris, we should recognize that we, you know, I always say we need 20 minutes or 20 seconds with a, just to bow our heads in shame. We've had a quarter of a century of doing nothing about climate change. So all the great and the good turning up here and people, academics as well, in our suits and our tweed jackets. Let's just us remember that we have fundamentally failed the poor and impoverished around the globe. We will have our failure will have resulted in the many, many deaths and certainly very many impoverished lives of poor people elsewhere who had nothing to do with climate change in terms of causing it. And I have to suffer the repercussions of our failure. And I do think a little bit of, a little bit of humility, a little bit of Head, holding our heads in shame and then standing upright, putting our shoulders back and saying, right, let's, what do we need to do? Is what, is, that's how we should start. But we're not prepared to even do that yet. We're not prepared to acknowledge where we are and what we've done. And that's my point about you know, hope only, useful hope only emerges if we're honest about the situation we face today. And we're not prepared to do that yet. And, and last point, pe people who've been listening, you know, obviously you're saying we need to all reduce our emissions. Once people have done, done that, I mean, what else, what else would you well, say people look, need to two do? Two things. First, I'm not saying we all have to reduce our emissions. I'm saying that those of us who are responsible for the lion's share of emissions have to reduce our emissions. Yeah, that's, that's certainly not everyone. It's probably, yeah, most, most of our listeners. Well, maybe, uh, yes, okay, I don't know who your audience, but it may well be most of our listeners. Well, it's not only reducing their emissions, it's about reducing their emissions and arguing with their friends, their colleagues, writing to their politicians. It, it is making the case way beyond just what they do themselves. But actually, if you don't do it yourself, and argue it elsewhere and you lose credibility so I think you have to demonstrate you know, action yourself and make the case elsewhere and the other thing of course is that we also have to argue for a rapid shift away from fossil fuels fossil fuels I mean the very blunt message from this fossil fuels have to stay in the ground 80 to 90 percent of all the current reserves need to stay in the ground if we're serious of two degrees C so we have to be arguing for that so the point I made earlier today countries like Norway the UK and someone else made the point about Australia these are countries with huge renewable energy opportunities wealthy populations and very well educated. They should be producing no fossil fuels. So the oil and gas in the UK should stay in the ground, no more shale gas in the UK on development of shale gas. The Norwegians should close down their North Oil industry and the, the Australians should stop producing coal. We all know that it's fossil fuel use that affects climate change. Not, it doesn't matter how many renewables you've got, if you're still burning the fossil fuels, then that's no good. So if rich countries like ours aren't prepared to do that, then we, we have no hope. So that's, that's the sort of 
scale of change that we need, and it's incumbent on your listeners, I would argue, if they think climate change is important, to not only be making the changes themselves about how they use energy, but to be pushing really hard for their governments to move away from a fossil fuel-based economy. Well, Kevin Anderson, thanks so much for joining us. That's my pleasure. Thank you very much. That was my conversation with Kevin Anderson, Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester and the co-director of the Tyndall Centre, the UK's leading climate change research organisation. And that's all for The Elephant this time. The Elephant is put together by myself, Kevin Kaners, along with Matthias Gutz and Christina Peters, and it's made with support from the Climate Kick, that's KIC, Alumni Association. It's a community of entrepreneurs and young professionals working on creating a climate resilient society. You can find out more at ckaa.eu. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at Elephant Podcast, and we're online at elephantpodcast.org. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon.